I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. You like to move it. Sup, y'all, and welcome to Population and Migration Unit 2, Part 7. In this video, we're going to look at why do people migrate. There is a stark difference between forced migration, where the movers have no choice, such as the estimated more than 10 million Africans who were forced across during the slave trade. And then there is voluntary migration, where the movers respond to perceived opportunity and push and pull factors, such as the concentration of Haitians in Miami. To look at this map is to face a reality many people are unaware of. In the world today, there are as many as 30 million slaves estimated to be existing in conditions in which they are confined against their will. That's right, as many as 30 million. Now, this number corresponds with a definition of slavery that includes those that are in bonded labor, often to pay back debts, those in forced labor, and finally, the trafficked slaves, or what most people traditionally think of as the victims of slavery. Although slavery is officially illegal in all countries today, obviously the practice of slavery is still a reality for an unacceptably high number of men, women, and children in our modern world. Now, back in 1885, Ernst Ravenstein came up with these laws of migration, which involve push and pull factors. Now, bear in mind that economic factors are the main cause of all migration. But some of his laws state that each migration flow produces a compensating counterflow which is usually smaller than the initial migration. This is called return migration. Also, most migrants only move a short distance, and most migration proceeds step by step and is rural to urban. Now this began on a large scale with the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century in the advanced economies of Europe and the United States when job opportunities opened up in factories in urban areas. This process is now taking place in developing economies of the world in South America, Africa, and Asia where industrialization has been occurring. For example, the case in China of rural to urban migration is especially distinct. Another law states that long distance migrants go to one of the great centers of commerce and industry, or big cities. And natives of towns and cities are less migratory than those from rural areas. Bear in mind that most migrants are young adults and that families are less likely to make international moves. So in our world today, migrants are less than 3% of the world's population, despite better transport technology and leaky borders. Ravenstein was also an early observer of what is known as the gravity model of migration, which was derived from Newton's law of gravity, and is a mathematical prediction of the degree of interaction between two places. The law essentially states that any two locations attract one another with a force that is proportional to the product of their importance and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So, interaction can be calculated through migration, automobile traffic, phone calls, and so on. Furthermore, the importance of a place according to the gravity model is almost exclusively based on the population numbers. However, there are a plethora of other variables that attract people to locations, such as relative wealth, the cultural landscape, and so on. Pay close attention to the graph itself. And notice that distance between locations carries with it an exponential impact. You see, if it was a direct effect, the reduced interaction would be represented by a straight line. However, since interaction is inversely proportional to distance squared, you see this curved line. What this means is that a slight change at short distances tend to have great impacts on interaction. Just think, for example, how a few extra minutes or miles in your daily commute can cause a lot of frustration. This also means that even large changes at greater distances tend to have a much smaller impact on interaction. So if you were flying from Miami all the way to London, you likely would not be overly incensed if you landed in one airport or another. Perhaps Heathrow would be closer to your hotel than Gatwick, but after spending the time and money in traveling thousands of miles, a few more either way would generally have a minimal impact on your decision making. So, obviously, two places with large populations and a relatively small distance between them would have much more interaction than, let's say, two places with smaller populations and a greater distance between them. This is the essence of distance decay, which essentially has two distinct yet related meanings. The first that we have talked about involves the negative impact that time and distance have on interaction, which is what the gravity model is based on. 
The other meaning deals with the loss of cultural traits due to a migrant's distance from their home base. So if someone moves a great distance, they are more likely to be around people less like themselves. And since our brains are programmed to adapt to our surroundings, that person would tend to adopt more of the cultural traits of those around them. And this all relates to one of the most fundamental laws we deal with in this course. And that is Waldo Tobler's first law of geography. Yeah! This law states, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. Ultimately, distance separates. Now to look at a couple types of voluntary migration, we can start with step migration, which is when a migrant follows a path of a series of stages or steps towards a final destination. Now this graphic shows a Ravenstein migration system where all net migration goes up from a smaller to a larger urban spectrum. Now for example, you might have a peasant family in Brazil who's likely to move first to a village and then to a nearby town, later to a city, and then finally to a metropolis, such as Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. At each stage, a new set of pull factors comes into play. So along the way, many people may be captured by intervening opportunities. Now let's take a look at Stouffer's Law of Intervening Opportunities, which states the number of persons going to a given distance is directly proportional to the number of opportunities at that distance, and inversely proportional to the number of intervening opportunities. It is for this reason why so many Mexican farmers migrate to the United States, as opposed to Europe, for example. So, like the great Yankee Yogi Berra once said, when you get to that fork in the road, take it. Keep in mind, people may travel great distances if they are desperate, as was the case with many Japanese peasants after the Meiji Restoration. With the elimination of the feudal system in the late 1800s, many migrated to Brazil, which was in need of labor due to the elimination of slavery. This was a good example of complementarity. Now, that poster you see there reads, let's go to South America with the family. Even more migration occurred after World War I, and today, there has been a relatively small stream of return migration back to Japan. That is correct. 